Welcome to another episode of Anything Goes Hokkaido video and audio podcast. I'm Delena. I'm Shinya. And today and... we have a special guest. <laughs> yeah, my name's Geraldine, or uh, my friends call me Jerry. And um, I'm here in Kuchan at the moment over the summer. Oh, wow. I didn't realize you had moved to Kuchan. Or have you been there the whole time? Uh, yeah, I moved to Kuchan in uh, in May, beginning of May. Okay. And before that? Uh, before that, I was living in Sapporo. I was yeah, in that's Sapporo. That's what I thought. Yeah. Five years. Yeah, five years in Sapporo. So you've been in Hokkaido five plus years then? Yeah, just over five years now. Nice. And what brought you to our lovely island? Um, I originally came because I really wanted to um, experience the mountains. I was in Japan for a year already and I love living here. You know, it's very safe and it's very clean. And um, I really wanted to experience more skiing and snowboarding and hiking. Um, so I came out to Hokkaido just to have, you know, more to be close to nature and to enjoy like the countryside and the, and the more kind of slow pace of life. Yeah, where were you living before you came to Hokkaido? Uh, I lived in Tochigi in Utsunomiya, closer yeah. to Tokyo. But I, you know, I, I liked Honshu for the, um, some of the like uh, more traditional kind of Japanese, um, the history there, but I didn't enjoy summer. Summer was way too hot for me. So up wow. here in Hokkaido, we have a really nice, you know, weather all year round. And yeah, I enjoy it very much. I mean, that's Same one of the here. reasons I'm up here too, yeah. Hiking, skiing, snowboarding, get get away from the heat. Yeah. I think that's for a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, for sure. A Florida girl here, like, when I go home to Florida, I just get into like, okay, it's super hot summer mode, and that's fine for a couple of weeks, but I'm even really hot sitting here with a jacket on <laughs> <laughs> right now. I, I want to just like, get into my uh, tank top Florida style but I'm kind of super almost hyper aware these days about Japanese culture and like showing your shoulders is kind of a no-no mm, typically right. so I'm like even though our viewers are not necessarily gonna care about that at the same time I was like maybe I should wear a jacket <laughs> if it gets too hot though I'm gonna strip it off and just say like yeah <laughs> So, uh, Geraldine, you spent um, five years in Sapporo, where we are, and then Kuchan, what made you move there? Um, well, I, uh, I finished work at the end of March, and um, I was working in Tokyo International School Kindergarten in Sapporo, and then, you know, I kind of decided, like, 2020 was, like, the year that I was going to go traveling, you know, and I was getting ready to kind of leave <laughs> nice, my job, nice go timing. traveling. And then eventually get back to the UK, you know, and spend some time with my family. Um, and, and yeah, 2020 was not the best year. For <laughs> so actually, my, my original plan was to cycle from uh, Sapporo to back to London with my friend. So for two years, we were planning a long bike trip. Uh, he lives in Myanmar. <laughs> That's and he fly. was going to fly here with his bike and then together we would cycle back to England through China, <laughs> through Korea, through China, through Mongolia, through, um, you know, Central Asia and back to London. Um, then obviously this uh, pandemic happened and, you know, my friend cancelled his flight and I'd already quit my job and I'd moved out of my apartment. And, you know, I, I, I kind of thought, like, where should I go now? What should I do now? And... Uh, I, I cycled by myself for a while, like I, I cycled from Sapporo down to Sendai. I got as far as Sendai in Honshu and um, they declared the state of emergency for the coronavirus and uh, it wasn't safe to be out on the road or camping. So then I took the ferry back to Hokkaido and I have friends here in Kuchan. Uh, there's a big foreigner community here in Kuchan. It's very easy to find a room to rent. You know, my friends live up the road. Um, you know, it's it's kind of like life on easy mode, really. 
to be in this area for me. So I was really grateful to come back and have, you know, a safe place where I could kind of be inside and, you know, a hot shower after, you know, living out on the bike and things as well. Um, yeah, so it's really beautiful here. Like you can't see it now, but Mount Yote is like under all of those clouds, you know, out of the window. You can see Mount Yote from my room. So I feel very lucky that I found a, you know, a safe place to be during this pandemic time. Oh, yeah, that's incredible. Great story. How long were you cycling? Like, how long did it take you to get from Sapporo to Sendai, you said? Yeah, to Sendai, about three weeks. Yeah, about three that's weeks. Not bad. So I took, I took a ferry from Hakodate to Oma and then cycled and then... Uh, Cycled from Oma and then in Iwate, there was like no coronavirus cases actually. So it's yeah. lots of countryside and I felt very safe there. But as I started getting closer to uh, Sendai City, there was more kind of closed campsites and um, even the convenience store, like seating areas were kind of closed off. So it was kind of quite hard to be out on the road and people were a bit suspicious of you know anyone who's kind of traveling or coming from the outside so yeah i just kind of tried to kind of bail as quickly as possible and that meant that like my last few days like my longest day i did 112 kilometers in one day trying to get to my friend's house in sendai um, mm. and then the, i arrived in the park and like you know it was all roped off like clothes for coronavirus and everything and i was mm. so tired you know so i had to go and find somewhere else to put my tent so you know it was challenging but very enjoyable as well um mm, yes you did this all by yourself yeah i did yeah wow yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to get to Okinawa, that was the plan, you know, I can't go international, so I will just try and cycle, you know, the, as far as I possibly can, and then, um, you know, obviously when the government is advising the state of emergency, that means it's not safe to carry on, and I really wanted to, you know, follow the instructions that they gave us, so, yeah, that's when I kind of... Uh, ran ran back to Hokkaido, the safety of Hokkaido. <laughs> So what have you been doing in Kuchan? Um, so uh, since I arrived, uh, I've been sewing face masks and selling them, you know, to the local community. Um, uh, sometimes I had to wear a paper mask at work and I felt like it didn't really fit very well. And um, they're very hard to come by in the shops as well. You know, they had very limited supply. So, you know, I decided that I would make my own. So this is my sewing machine. Yeah, and this is the first mask that I made, and uh, you know, at the time I didn't eat, I didn't have an iron at the time, so you know, I just did it, you know, kind of quite. It was quite rough, but mm. I just found that the shape of the pattern, you know, fits very well on my face. Like it makes a good seal. It makes a good seal around the nose and a really good seal around the chin. And uh, using a fabric mask, you know, I can wash it with laundry soap and then use it again. Um, so it's more environmentally friendly to be using a, a fabric mask, you know, and then I could save money on buying the paper masks. So, yeah, this was the first one that I made. And then my I had a French housemate and uh, he had the same thing. He said, oh, I've been wearing this paper mask for three days and, you know, the elastic is broken and, you know, that's not very... Uh, it's not very sanitary anymore, you know, so I said like, oh, I have the sewing machine, so I'll make one for you as well. So after I made them for him, he really encouraged me like, hey, you know, these are really good. You should advertise to lo local people, you know, maybe you can sell some more and, and kind of help encourage the local community here to wear the face mask in public places. Yeah, yeah. that's great. And uh, for example, for some foreigners like me that don't like wearing face masks um wearing is actually quite comfortable just wearing it today going out for lunch um wearing glasses as well so usually just the typical what is it, elastic 
like this face mask these elastic i can't really see it because of the light but the elastic face mask yeah when you wear it there's like open spaces um if you're wearing glasses they fog up lots of things like that but with your face mask it covers everything it's quite comfortable yeah so yeah. i do recommend it why don't we model the ones that we have here <laughs> you have your phone? yeah sure sure yeah i think this is my favorite so i'll put on this one and, and i do have a big face so the masks fit <laughs> well compared I feel like to I have a bigger nose you know than most japanese people so maybe that was yeah. why you know compared to the of... what is that i'm gonna call them abe diapers because they look like diapers on your face <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah they're really good yeah and uh i did some research you know i've been reading every article that's coming out about you know the masks have been tested and do they work or not and uh all the you know research that's been doing now which i mean until the pandemic there was you know not really much research into these things they're advising that you have like three layers three or more layers so then i i changed the design so it has a pocket in in inside so you can put inside you know like some people you uh, using like a coffee filter or paper towel as disposable or you could put in another layer of fabric if you wanted to and then take it out to wash it or like a foam some of the masks have like a foam made of the foam instead so really you know it's your choice if you want to you know add the extra layer um and i think it depends what you're doing you know if you're playing sport or something then maybe you don't want to have you know that kind of thickness so you can adjust it you know how you like what's the name of your budding company oh, <laughs> oh i don't know if it's silly or not it's i named it fabulous fabrics for your face and oh, then I love uh, that. in instagram we have like a shorter form it's fab face fabrics mm -hmm. yes fab face fabric so you know i i think like in the west we you know we're really like battling against like a whole se centuries of vanity from um you know ad advertisements that have said like you have to have a nice face and look pretty and wear lipstick and all of these things and then now this pandemic is here and they're advising people oh please wear a mask in public a lot of people really don't want to and part of it is you know they don't it's uncomfortable for them but i think a big part of it is like you know it's it's strange they feel like they don't look nice or they feel like you know a bit self-conscious about it you know and uh, i had friends from the uk contact me saying like just please make me one that's beautiful because you know i don't want to wear it but i want to love it and if i love it you know then i will wear it so if we can like kind of fight towards making it fun and making it fashionable you know then hopefully people will be more likely to kind of follow the advice of the government and you know we can kind of protect our communities from from these um you know this awful disease that is going around and all of the, these infections because in Japan it's you know it's very normal to wear a mask in the supermarket but in the yeah. UK it's completely new for everybody there so oh, of course wearing a mask feels a little bit scary um people who wear masks are mainly for of course their religion or you can be seen as like some sort of terrorist and things like that it's that sort of image so very very different in cultures but i do think for especially women uh if they don't want to go outside with without makeup just wear a mask easy just put it on for, it takes 10 seconds there you go yeah you oh definitely that's 30 minutes to an hour putting makeup on just to go outside and do something just wear a mask and it's all good <laughs> Didn't you yeah. know that's actually been a really common practice in Japan for a long yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, I knew, yeah. Women who don't want to but... put on their makeup just wear the mask. Um, and at, before the pandemic, I remember some teachers, some of my colleagues, kind of complaining about students wearing masks in class all the time, maybe because they just didn't want to get ready properly or whatever. But mm. yeah, I think it's fine. And I absolutely love the fit 
of your masks. They're, like Shinya said, um, if you wear glasses, which I always used to, now I tend to wear contacts, but if you're wearing glasses with the usual paper disposable masks, they're going to fog up. It's almost imp- it's like a no-win situation. No. And uh, very uncomfortable, but I hadn't when I have worn my glasses with these, I didn't have any trouble. And I'm wearing them to teach kindergarten. Uh, in our family, we actually have a dedicated like uh, pot where we boil our masks and get them to the temperature that will kill viruses Jeez. and then hang them up. So, well, my partner's a bit of a hypochondriac, I think. So, <laughs> kind of. But yeah, that is also actually a very simple way. And they, the one that I had you custom make for me, the other one, the really pretty blue fabric, I think it's hanging up now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've washed it or like boiled it so many times and it still looks absolutely fabulous. So oh, I think you've got a, a real winner with this yeah. business project. That's an interesting phrase. Yeah, I'm just going to casually boil my mask <laughs> um, first time I've heard of that one. But yeah, you I can don't understand. want to mistake it for for the dinner, you know, <laughs> pour yourself a bowl of soup. It like, feels oh, look, like I have in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's why it's like a dedicated one that's like going to be used for nothing else. I have a uh, there's a bar there's a, a bar of laundry soap you can buy in Homac that's uh, like all natural ingredients. I think it's cheap, 100 yen, 150 yen. So you know if you're doing hand washing, you know maybe that could be useful to wash. That's what I've been using to wash my mask in the evening. Mm. So not not boiling water, but hot water, and then the the laundry soap. And it's nice to have something with no chemicals and no additives, you know, because you are going to put it back onto your face the next day. So you right. have to be careful with what we treat them. You know, if you treat it with the chemicals, you'll be breathing the chemicals after. Yeah, I think that's another reason why we just boil ours, but they smell amazingly fresh. Even with that, like, I think it really does kill all the things that make make fabrics tend to smell bad. So oh, it's very good. simple. So there's like no soap or anything happening with uh, ours. Yeah, and we do that with the paper mask as well, because you can actually like throw those in the laundry on mist- by mistake and they come out OK, as long as you don't dry them <laughs> in the <laughs> in the dryer. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I always prefer to wear your masks when I go to work because they do just fit so nicely. And I love that you custom make them by asking like somebody's height. So my children, I was concerned, my older son, who has always just had a really, like, big head. <laughs> like, Damn, even when he me. was... That's that's me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's <laughs> maybe it's a bit of a Hafu thing or just the, the DNA. But even when Your he was in one? kindergarten... My oldest son, yeah. When he was hey, in kindergarten and we had son, to get... So. <laughs> when we had to get uh, the winter hat for him to wear for, like, outdoor play... We had to buy an adult size hat. None of the kids sizes would fit his head. It's just very round. Mm. Um, And so I was thinking after I gave you his height, I was like, oh, maybe I should have just ordered an adult mask. But it fits him perfectly. Oh, I'm glad. I I could wear them all the time. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm nervous making them for children because, you know, they're obviously children are all very varied. So. You know, I was like, when I was making them, I was like, oh, gosh, I hope these fit. Um, oh, they do really well. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. Thank you. No, I, you did an excellent job with that. So, uh, again, where can we find you if people want to order masks? Um, so I just I just opened a shop on Etsy. So if you search for my brand, Fab Face Fab Bricks, is all one word, on Etsy, then you can find my masks. And I kind of organized my stock into that shop because um you know before i was like sending people lots of photos and they would choose and then you know we were back and forth about the size so now that i have everything organized in the shop you can just see exactly what i have in stock you can put it in the basket you can see how much the postage is and then in the notes section you can tell me you know what size that you like so i am using people's height to try and gauge you know if they need 
um, a bigger or smaller size but I also like to know if there's any defining features you know like if you have a very wide face or you know a, a larger nose or anything you know special that you'd like me to do um, then I try my best to make sure they fit because you know obviously that's so important for being comfortable but also you know being safe and uh, blocking any kind of um, any kind of disease transmitting through them. I want to know if it's not a trade secret. How did you come up with this design? Because I've not seen one like it. Oh, um, I <laughs> YouTube, <laughs> lovely YouTube, helped me. So yeah, I found uh, I found the pattern on YouTube, and uh, I think I, I originally chose this one over some of the others because, um, you know, I'd seen some of the ones that were just kind of like two pieces of fabric kind of sewn together and I found that there was that big space around the nose and then often they didn't really wrap around the chin either so I spent a while kind of browsing the YouTube videos and you know I, I found something that I thought you know looks neat and uh, would fit well but the I guess I customized it because I made the pocket inside mm. so that's kind of a new feature that yes so thank Very you, YouTube. Nice. Learn many things. <laughs> how about University. the sewing skills? How about the sewing skills? Where did you learn how to sew? Also, uh, my mom is, uh, she's really good, actually. My mom makes uh, um, clothes just as a hobby, but she makes all kinds of dresses and she made me some dungarees. And, um, you know, my, 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 my own skills were, you know, fairly, fairly basic. I've made... I've made a jumpsuit and I, I've made some kind of pillowcases, um, but you know she she's she's been teaching me and the, I've never had so much free time as this. So it's right. actually really nice to have free time to explore my own interests and you know my own hobbies um, because I had the sewing machine a long time and I've made a few things, but this is like the first time when you know now that I'm not working full time I can kind of explore you know things that I want to do and actually creating things on the machine is really satisfying for me nice and something uh, with the audience about the differences between how do I say western style uh, sewing machines compared to Japanese sewing machines <laughs> oh yeah so this one like this this one doesn't have the foot pedal actually I'm sitting on the floor on a low table so lots of Japanese style you know is uh sitting on the floor so you can't have a foot pedal with this type of machine so it's just a button to switch on and off and start and stop um so yeah it's a little bit different um but yeah I, I got the hang of it I think it's uh, important to like check you know have a free hand to push the button with the with the foot pedal it's hands free so you kind of have to be uh a little more kind of quick to kind of act to make sure that you're controlling the machine. Oh yeah, I have a machine like that as well. And um, I also really like to sew. I don't do it frequently because I don't have much free time, but I've made dresses and skirts and costumes. Um, I made a really cool Mad Hatter hat for my husband for his birthday one year. Oh, and that cool. won a Halloween costume contest <laughs> later. Oh. Um, so I like to do those kind of projects. Um, my husband actually sews as well because one of his jobs besides drawing manga is um, making like figures. And so before 3D printers and 3D scanners and modeling became such an accessible thing, he was hand making these like 12 inch dolls or figurines and uh, sometimes like a pro wrestler or Angelina Jolie or Jackie Chan and he'd be making all the little detailed costumes oh, and sometimes I helped with that as well yeah it's really satisfying to kind of you know create something that you know is 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 beautiful and and yeah. uh, you know and every time that you're you're always improving as well you know it's really it's really a practice mm. so yeah but yeah I totally I understand what you mean with the pushing the buttons and having that quick fingers and <laughs> being aware <laughs> We did actually manage to get a foot pedal for our machine years later, and that's okay. been a nice. So you might <laughs> check and see if, if they have it as an accessory for the machine. 
Uh, you have it. It, it might yeah. be available. Mm, yeah, and then I could put it on like the full size table. That helps too. Yeah. I've, I've also done the low table style as well, and it's <laughs> a bit hard on the back. <laughs> I think I got used to sitting on the floor. You know, if I had a day with a lot of orders, I spend quite a long time sitting on the on the floor. So then, when I did the elastic part, you know, I would try and sit in a chair just so that I could kind of <laughs> move my back around. Um, mm. Mm, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 really nice having having free time to explore, explore interests and make things, um, and uh, you know, I'm kind of hoping that it's gonna help people to kind of, uh, you know, stay safe in this in this funny situation that we have really, because um, I think in the UK it's a worse situation than here at the moment. Right. Um- we have a lot of fun on this show where me being American and Shinya being from Australia, sometimes the words we use don't always connect the same way. Um, you said dungarees. What exactly oh, are dungarees? dungarees. Oh, <laughs> what would you what would you call them in American? Or maybe overalls? Okay, yes, well, I, probably. Yeah. I can show you. They're just right here. So I bought this fabric in Tokyo and I was like, oh, I love this. You know, I didn't know what what we were going to make. And uh, I bought it in Tokyo and I sent it to my mum. And she said, well, what do you want? And I said, well, you know, I'd really like to have a pair of dungarees. So if I stand back, maybe you can see the whole thing. So they're very pink oh. and I have this cute like little matching headband as well. But I think afterwards she said, you know, you really challenge me because that's probably one of the most difficult things that I've made. You know, not just a t-shirt or something simple, but um, overalls. And then they have, uh, you know, the full pockets and the pockets on the side and the, the big front pocket as well. And oh, those then she, are adorable. She always leaves the seam open for me so that I can decide how short I want to be, the shorts to be. Yeah, wow. so I'm, I'm actually really, you know, recently I've been thinking a lot about my family, you know, partly because I'm here and I'd, you know, like to be there in this kind of global pandemic situation. But um, I'm also really grateful to my parents for showing me these like survival skills you know, just being able to being able to cook, you know, I can keep a really low budget if I can, you know, cook well. And that's something my parents have taught me. And then, you know, I've been able to kind of make a bit of an income selling the masks and things. And that's something that my mum's taught me. So, you know, even though they're on the other side of the world, I'm like really grateful for, you know, all of the skills that, that they've showed me uh, when I was growing up because, you um, you know, I'm still here, <laughs> even despite this uh, terrible timing or, I mean, now. Okay. Yeah, that's really wonderful to have such a great heritage from your family. And uh, what are some of your favorite dishes to cook that your family taught you? Um, I really like it's It's a bit naughty, but I really like banoffee pie. Have you had banoffee pie before? Oh, I've never, I've never even, even heard of it. Banoffee pie. pie. It's like a cheesecake base. So, you know, like a butter and um, butter Biscuit. and biscuits. Or you call them cookies, right? Cookies. Yeah, I know some American <laughs> words too. So biscuit base and then uh, a layer of kind of caramel, which you make by boiling condensed milk in the can. Oh, so it's actually a sweet pie. Mm, yeah, sweet I pie. I was assuming like a more of like a meat or like a shepherd's oh, pie yeah. style. But... <laughs> That's very British as well to have like a steak and kidney pie. Yeah, and, like, steak and kidney. Like that, yeah. No, banoffee pie is like toffee and bananas and whipped cream and then chocolate on top. Wow. So... <laughs> wow. Sounds so <laughs> decadent. Yeah, nice for a party, but maybe not every day. Yeah, I have to be careful making things like that because I have no self-control when it comes to sweets. Yes. Yeah, and I recently discovered a recipe from a, another British friend. Um, it's like a giant cookie that you make in a fry pan. And it takes 30 minutes from start to finish. You never have to turn the oven on. And it's the best cookie I've ever had in my life. So I'll probably never make another kind again. 
Because it, it gets crispy on the bottom and then it's like chewy on the top. Yum. And in the, the video um, from the BBC program, I think Nadia is cooking or something. Um, she puts like cho- uh, candy coated chocolates, like kind of a pastel M&Ms or something. And it's really pretty. But I had white and milk chocolate bars. So I just did a chocolate chunk. And of course yeah. it melted and... When I tried, I'm very impatient when it comes to this stuff as well as my kids. So I just tried to slide it from the frying pan onto wax paper to cool and it folded in half. And so I'm quickly like using the spatula to fix it. And some of the crispy bottom bits are on the top and it's mixed up a bit, but it became this beautiful like swirled white and dark chocolate pattern yeah. and like a bow tie cake kind of thing. And then threw it in the freezer, slice it up 10 minutes later. Oh, so good. Yeah. So. Yeah, That's but your banana pie sounds amazing too. <laughs> well, here that you know, I don't have an oven in this house, so maybe cooking in the pan is a <laughs> yeah, is a good yeah. Yeah, a lot of Japanese places don't have ovens, or if you do, it's just like your microwave oven, so it's quite small. Mm, sometimes, yeah. Yeah, sometimes my friends like, oh yeah, I, we have an oven, and I go to their house, and it's just like. A toaster style, you know, and yeah. it's not like a proper oven. It's like I want to bake. I want like a roast. I want to roast some beef or like roast some chicken, you know. And you can't <laughs> do that in one of those. So. No. When I first moved here, I think I, all I had was a rice cooker, so I was making cakes in the rice cooker. I just mix it up there and put it in, you know. And it it works actually, you know. It does cook it through. So. <laughs> Every time yeah. I've been making desserts now, everything's been like, if I make cheesecake, I would just make it like a rare one. So you just put it in the fridge. I would make, for example, Rocky Road. And that one is just in the fridge as well. So. Um, well, you can try banoffee pie now because you can do banoffee that. Just yeah. Yeah. I'm actually not a big fan of sweets. I <laughs> make it for special occasions, but I don't really eat much myself. Okay. Yeah. Me, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can, can well, more sensible, yeah. <laughs> Good. No, I can't. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yes, making desserts from fry pans, making desserts from <laughs> rice cookers. Pretty good. You have to get creative here because a lot of the things that I think in our country, our home countries, we take for granted, like having kind of large ovens, or even sometimes. You know, dryers are kind of rare here. Air conditioners are a bit rare in Hokkaido yes. as well. Dishwashers as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I imagine it, what it's like to put just put the dirty dishes in the in the dishwasher and you don't have to hand wash it. I can't remember what that's like actually. <laughs> yeah, I was happy to have a dishwasher when we built this place. However, my husband's style. Uh, again, a bit on the hypochondriac side, perhaps he hand washes everything before putting it into <laughs> the dishwasher. Anyway, I mean, so, like proper washing, or does he like, like rinse when it out I a open bit? Open it. I I think they're it's already washed. like done. Yeah, and there's been a couple times like those weren't run yet. It's like they looked perfectly clean. <laughs> so have to be kind of communicative about I've, that. I've never actually had a dishwasher in my childhood so i'm used to the hand washing mm-hmm. and having a dishwasher seems i don't know a bit of ex- expensive i don't know it's probably they probably it probably uses less water no Use, having that's a dishwasher. the idea yeah they are supposed to be more like eco-friendly uh environmentally friendly to use less water and less i mean i guess the heat as well like if you're just using running hot water the whole time versus it heating up the water in the machine yeah. And ours is quite small, so it, it's not like those huge ones that I feel probably are a bit more wasteful or take a long time to fill up. So it, it's good. Um, I really wanted to have a garbage disposal in our sink. Oh, um, yes. And the housemaker told us, like, it's not possible. But <laughs> I was like, why not? <laughs> Anything's possible if you try. But I didn't get my wish on that one, so... Oh, um, speaking of houses and such, we built this house about nine, ten years ago. But the summer before this one, we had that big earthquake in Hokkaido, right? And it turns out that my house is on a fault line. And so, yeah, it uh, tilted 
the whole foundation about six centimeters right off the bat after the earthquake happened. And like all the houses in this row have had damage. And then the houses on either side of me were fine, but then the houses like one over were on a different like fault line. So um, there's been a lot of construction happening. And so uh, we had this company come check it out and it's now 10 centimeters. Um, so the damage is kind of continuing to happen, but they're going to start construction next week and drill very, very deep into the earth until they hit bedrock and put these like pipes into it and jack up the house that little wow. bit. Wow. Thankfully, we don't have to move out or like really do anything inside except the last day they're going to adjust these little they have a lot of poles underneath the flooring between like the concrete base that um, will adjust the floor in a very like komakai, <laughs> very detailed way, I guess. So we have to kind of clear out some of the storage for them to access that. The only thing is that my garden is going to be destroyed. <laughs> uh. Well, my husband, um, I told him how happy I was that my front yard which I've been naturalizing for years to be just full of flowers and very beautiful instead of grass that you have to water and it's very non-eco-friendly and time-consuming. And it just the grass after the first year turned brown and I was cutting it with scissors because it wasn't a big enough space to justify buying like a lawnmower or even a weed whacker. Um, so now it's just full of flowers. It's gorgeous. I love it. I don't have to touch it most of the time. And he's like, oh, that's too bad. They're going to destroy it when they <laughs> fix the house. I'm like, no. But thankfully, the house uh, construction people were like, well, well, they actually said they didn't have to mess with the front yard at all. They would actually be able to like leave it as is, which is wonderful. But the side yard, which is mostly dirt anyway. Um, my husband doesn't really like a lot of plants, so I've let him keep it nothing there. But uh, they are going to be piling dirt up there and kind of destroying everything. So I have a few blueberry bushes or strawberry plants or things I need to move this weekend. If anyone wants to come help. <laughs> so anyway, but that's kind of like, um, I know that Sapporo wasn't hit. Well, I can't say that. My neighborhood wasn't too bad, but just walking distance from here was one of the worst parts of Sapporo when the earthquake happened. And they're still like doing construction on the roads even now um, mm. in places. And so there's like a lot of things happening with houses and buildings here mm. after that earthquake. Yeah, I mean, the technology is amazing that they're able to kind of drill down and, and secure, you know, the house, save the house. You yeah. know, I'm sure. You know, a few years ago, they would have had to kind of knock things down and really start again. So that's really, really impressive that they're able to kind of, you know, drill so far into the earth. It really is. And we had to wait this long because they didn't have enough supplies um, to get around to ours. So it's finally going to happen. And I'm glad yeah. we don't have to move. <laughs> but yeah, it's just been crazy. Like all these different natural disasters, pandemics. Uh, things that have been going on but mm. it's really nice that people like you are making the most of it and staying really positive and finding a way to support your community um, and I if people watching and listening aren't aware like Kuchan is very connected to Niseko which is usually known as the Australian village of Hokkaido <laughs> and it's greatly populated by foreigners uh, especially during like the ski season but yeah, I think there's a bit of a different culture there. So I loved hearing how you were encouraging people to wear the masks and mm. protect one another and making it something fun. And mm -hmm. uh, like, like this banana one was just like really. Yes, <laughs> you do have the fanciful. banana one. I do. Well, because you told me you don't wear masks. So I wasn't going to waste yeah. two of them on you. <laughs> so I gave you the, the more useful kind of masculine one. And then thought I would, because I wear masks every day now for teaching. So, although I could totally see you rocking the banana mask, I would wear a Hello Kitty mask. 
doesn't really matter. I'm not embarrassed at all. So. <laughs> no, if you look at my Etsy shop, then feel free to order some more. You know. That would, I would <laughs> definitely recommend. I don't, have, I don't have Hello Kitty, unfortunately. I like the seventies. There's like a one. There's like a seventies. What is it style? I saw oh, the I other see. day. I forgot exactly, but it was like a seventies, sort of black and red yeah. one. Oh yeah 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 yeah. That's pretty. I have the same in uh, different colors. Sorry, if you don't have video and you're listening to the podcast, I'm just showing these fabrics that I have, yeah, in stock at the moment. So types of patterns, yeah. Yeah, I, I think actually, you know, it's a new addiction for me now that I I get to go <laughs> out and like find all of these beautiful fabrics and you know buy them and bring them home. So I've become like a collector of like. Nice. Different- shapes so where are you sourcing your fabrics from um so i there's a, a a few shops there's a fabric shop in the in the kuchan town here and um, where i can buy things by the meter and then in the co-op there's also like a haberdashery there and that's where i get a lot of the kind of like you know really more kind of japanese style mm. fabrics and then um in homac as well in homac they they sell kind of um you know like a uh, nice colors in small pieces so yeah it's it's all local it's all kind of lo- locally sourced because it's quite a small town out here so those are the three places that i could find you know things mm-hmm. to use sorry haberdashery is that the uh, name of the shop or is that yeah, another word i don't know another word for sewing shop <laughs> Yeah. That means okay. sewing shop. Maybe it's a British, a uh, English. I'm not sure. In Australia, yeah. we say the same. You say, do you say haberdashery? Yeah. I like how we're representing these like three different continents here. You know, it's oh, kind of nice. Huh? <laughs> I mean, yes, I I know it, but I wouldn't say I use it. Maybe, but I do know it. I do know the word. I feel like uh. I've read it somewhere in a book before, but that. I had to ask, like, I'm not, I would never have been able on a test to be like, yes, it's a sewing shop. And of course, you wouldn't say trousers, right, Delena? <laughs> um, actually, this sounds just kind of outdated to me. But men's trousers, yeah. But for ladies, like, I, I wouldn't talk about wearing trousers. It sounds kind of masculine or outdated to me. I think of my grandpa wearing trousers or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so maybe like maybe British English has a little bit more of an old fashioned kind of sound to it. But I, I kind of find that I mix quite a lot because I worked with a lot of American people. So I would say like, oh, you know, put your trash in the bin, for example. So mm-hmm. trash is American English and then bin is British English. But yeah. I don't know, for some reason, like some of the American words have kind of stuck with me. And so, yeah, I find myself like mixing it all it's all a big melting pot, really, in this in this century. Well, language is certainly like that, and uh, of course, when you live in Japan or any foreign country for a while, and you're speaking that language, it you tend to mix words. Things like genkan, I always have to force myself if I'm speaking English to like say foyer or entry, mm. but genkan is so much easier, and because the Japanese entry to the house is different from what we have in the west where it's still considered part of the outside and that's where you take off your shoes and depending i don't think it's so much for hokkaido but i know other places the gangkan is really considered outside and so people will come straight into your house as if it's still part of the outside and coming up onto the house flooring would be like the the stopping point or the border Mm, right (laughs) yeah Yeah. so that's a bit weird or different some words in in Japanese it just doesn't really translate like there's an English equivalent word but it's like not really the same so yeah, yeah I think for Genkan like we don't really have Genkan you know in the UK like we we have a porch or an entrance way but it's not the same so using yeah. the Japanese word is more fitting so often I will use a whole English sentence but occasional Japanese words you know like for sure and like natsukashi is is one that i feel like you know we can say nostalgia but i don't use that word often no. in english at all but in japanese i i feel like it fits right know? i've been teaching people to say that brings back memories for natsukashi yeah, yeah. brings back memories yeah. a phrase uh-huh. yeah, other than nostalgia 
<laughs> yeah, nostalgia sounds too like stiff or uptight or like something you see in a, a movie scene or something. But、mm-hmm. yeah, oh, that brings back memories. That's k a s h i Yeah. Yeah, it's better for sure. I've had plans for so many years. I want to write a book called The Little Book of Gambare because I think it, it's possible to come with a, maybe a hundred different phrases for the word Gambare because <laughs> it all is so contextual. Yeah. And it would be like in Japanese, you can just change like Gambare, Gambate, Gambarimas, like the endings, and it's not very different. In what you're saying, but in English, you have to completely change the sentence.、Mm. So that's a project that's been on the back, back, back burner for years.、Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that's, you know, when I, when I first got here and I started working, I was taught, you know, Oskare sama des, like, oh, that's what you say, you know, when you leave work, and it means like, thank you for your, you know, thank you for your hard work and everything. But it doesn't, it means so much more than that. And then people would say it to me when I was like, Out in the shopping center, and I was really confused. Like, how did you do any work? Why are you saying it to me here? You know, so yeah. Yeah, anytime you want to, and, and people like, if you're hiking a trail and you pass by somebody that's going down, then you would be like, Otsukare sama.、Um, you know, so it is such a broad phrase that is very difficult to translate into English. I still haven't. I, in fact, I tell my students when I meet them, I was like, I want to tell you Otsukare sama, but I can't because there's no English equivalent for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if anybody out there has, has a good one, please like, send that to us. They should just、uh, use that Japanese word into English language. They should Maybe just we become... can popularize it. Yeah, because、yeah, the Japanese、yeah. do that for us, you know, like lots、yeah. of things, just like, oh, we'll just spell it in katakana and we'll just use that word because that's, you know, that's the word. So maybe we should return that and kind of, you、I、know, adopt it. Yeah, the、yeah. English <laughs> language takes words from other languages, French,、uh, other okay. languages. Yeah, so、definitely. why not Japanese? So. English has some words from Japanese that are so ingrained, I didn't realize it until just randomly coming across it. For example, head honcho.、Mm, yes. Comes from Japanese. Head honcho? Yeah, honcho. the head honcho, like、That's、the boss.、Right. Yeah. But that, that comes from honcho. Ah,、uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I never yeah, in I my life, like, until I came across it here a few years ago, was like, oh, that's Japanese. Uh, and of course, things that are like just directly from Japanese culture, like sushi is sushi, karate is karate in American pronunciation. Do you say karate or how do you pronounce it in your countries?、Uh, karate. Karate with a hard T. Okay. okay. Oh no, I have thinking too much. Karate? No, it's not karate, it's karate. Karate, karate yeah. yeah, karate, I think. How do you say kara- karaoke? Karaoke. <laughs> karaoke. Okay, same. Karaoke.、Thing. Yeah, karaoke. Karaoke.、Mm. Uh, what, what is it? Kamikaze? In kamikaze. Kamikaze or something. Kamikaze, I think. Kamikaze. Yeah. Kamikaze. Are there any <laughs> other words、um, that you can think of that we do use in English from Japanese? I mean, a lot of food. Yeah, definitely. Food is up there. Uh, yeah, ramen, definitely. Ah, yeah. yes. Food, what else? Of course, places and things like that, but not necessarily like random words.、Mm. Yeah,、Specific、I, I guess、words. like、uh, Tokyo in Japanese, what is Tokyo? Tokyo.、So. That pronunciation, I Tokyo. think. Tokyo.、Mm. Throws people Kyoto. off. Kyoto. <laughs> Kyoto, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely、uh, a different world, and perhaps we can. Ah, bento. Bento is a word that's become popular in the US over the last decade、uh, because somebody ingeniously made bento lunchboxes a thing. So. You wouldn't just say bento box? I don't know.、Um, that's why I just said bento lunchbox because we do have a lunchbox culture in the US. And then the bento lunch boxes are just like another newer version of that brought in from Japan. But maybe bento box as well would be fine. Or just bento. Random question for Geraldine, but do you like Marmite? 
yes, I love Marmite. <laughs> I love okay. it, but I don't, I don't like I don't like the Australian Marmite version. Vegemite. Vegemite, and then there's also a New Zealand Marmite as well. Okay. That I, I, none of the none of the like Antipodean ones are the same as the British ones. So I only really like the English one <laughs> because oh, I probably grew up with that one. So the texture is very different. Definitely. Yeah, well, okay. I grew up with Vegemite, so... Oh, yes, you don't I like definitely... our Marmite, probably. It's okay, it's okay, but I do prefer Vegemite over Marmite. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I, I know what these words are supposed to mean, but I have never tried either of these. Uh, what is the difference, as far as you said, texture between Marmite and Vegemite? Um, Marmite is kind of more syrupy. It kind of looks like molasses. And then Vegemite is kind of more like fudge, you know, so it's yeah. stickier, kind of like, it's it's slightly harder mm -hmm. um, texture. Um, and then, I don't know, the taste, it's very hard to describe because, I mean, they it's yeast extract, it's so they're very just, salty. It's salty. <laughs> it's really salty, <laughs> but with butter on bread, you know, it's really... Yeah. I, delicious but yeah. i think there's no american equivalent am i right there's no, no i don't think we have anything like that in it's the u.s <laughs> that would be <laughs> widely known or popular mm. um i have wondered there is a paste made from nori um that's that tastes Japan. really good oh, yeah I haven't uh, is, is that similar to no Vegemite no no no, completely different. That one actually tastes good. <laughs> <laughs> the, the seaweed paste. What is it? Like Gohan Desio? It's called like Gohan the brand. Desio. The brand yeah. is called Gohan Desio. And yeah. it just, it's just like a seaweed paste and you mix it with rice and it's really, really good. Is it in a uh, jar or in a yes. cheese? It's in like a jar. In a jar. white, sort of white, what is a white jar and it has like colorful writing on it. Mm -hmm. And, but the difference between Marmite and Vegemite is so different. No, if it's Japan, it's natto. Right, yeah. That's the, I, I would say that's the equivalent. I don't like natto though, so maybe that's just, you know, what I... It's just I like more, that. it's more like Japanese eat natto, Japanese people eat natto when they're very young and it's very, very specific. And then we Dash eat Marmite eat. or Vegemite, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, uh, very, very <laughs> difficult flavor to adapt to for a lot of us foreign people mm. yeah but i used to eat veg cheese and vegemite sandwiches when i was growing up um yeah need you definitely need butter for both yeah, marmite and vegemite yeah yeah okay geraldine i've heard a lot about beans and toast mm -hmm. is that truly oh like yeah British australia oh, as well? yeah. It's Do you really have popular, but it, you can buy it here in Kuchan because we have a lot of them. Um, oh, sorry, my housemates are just here. If you can hear that. Okay. Um, so uh, you can buy it here in Kuchan actually, but you know it's imported, so it's actually quite expensive. But at home, that would be kind of like it's a real basic food staple that you know you can buy very cheaply in the supermarket. But here, because it's been imported, it's kind of become a like gourmet thing to have beans on toast and it's just mm. like it's baked beans with you know tomato sauce yes. um and it's something that i yeah i would have if i was feeling unwell you know at home and uh, it's kind of comfort food really do you and guys have spaghetti on toast as well yes yeah, spaghetti on toast and spaghetti yeah. hoops as well yeah. <laughs> we had as kids or with the jacket potato, it's really nice as well. Like big baked potato and butter, and then uh, beans or spaghetti hoops inside. But oh my um, goodness, carbohydrate I mean, overload. I had them as kids, but thinking back on it now, like I imagine that there's probably quite a lot of like sugar and additives and things like that, you know, in those like uh, processed. It's, it seems like very processed. So I try to cook from scratch as much as possible. But if you're having a day where you're feeling really unwell, having those comfort foods from your childhood can be you know, really, really nice and make you feel better. So I, I think occasionally for a treat, you know, it's nice to have things like that. <laughs> oh, for sure. I think it's similarly. Not, it's not a necessity. <laughs> <laughs> it it's can be necessary. nice. 
Mm. Uh, same thing, spam was like one of the cheapest foods in the U.S. when I was growing up and not something you necessarily wanted to be eating, but because it was like easy and didn't cost a lot. But it's really pricey if you buy it here in the shops. Yeah. And then also like Hawaii made spam musubi, uh, a really popular dish. So sometimes my mother-in-law makes that. It's like spam sushi. Oh, right. It's horrible. It's horrible. <laughs> it's all right. You have to fry it really well. Do the soy sauce or any sauce with that? Uh, I think mayonnaise. Uh, mayonnaise. So, like the rice and then some mayonnaise, spam, and then like a piece of seaweed around it to do the musubi. I, I think my dad used to use that spam to for fishing when I was a kid. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> we would yeah, have it in yeah. the cupboard, but I don't think I don't remember eating it. Eat I used it. To take it and use it on the hooks, you know, to catch fish. <laughs> Oh, uh, my yeah. Filipino friends love spam, but growing up, probably similar to maybe both of you, but going to like a deli or yeah. even the supermarket, they have the deli and buying sliced meat and things like yeah. that was much better than tin ham. Yeah, yeah. for sure. No, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's really awesome to hear about what you're doing during this pandemic and uh, the new life you've started up in Kuchan. And wow. really look forward to hearing how your cycling trips go in the future once that's become yeah. possible. Thank you. Uh, before we go, I took a minute right before we got online and stepped in my garden and uh, thought I'd show you, all our viewers, some of the beautiful flowers that are in bloom in Hokkaido right now. Lupins. Yes, yeah, lupin, uh, lupina in Japanese. Uh, these purple and pink ones, they get quite tall. And of course, like uh, some Shasta daisies are oh, no. very, very in bloom at the moment. I do not know what this yellow one is, but it's like overtaking my yard. <laughs> but it comes up in the spring, it's very nice. Then we have some, I believe, columbine, we call them in, in American English. Um, they're very delicate and cute and common pinks and purples mm. and then i also don't quite know what this purple flower is but it's a bit of a another thing that's easy to find in hokkaido this season so if you have a chance you definitely want to visit gardens and parks and enjoy all of the colors that are happening around our island at this time so um once again you can find geraldine's etsy store it's fabulous fabrics and her Facebook page is Fabulous Fabrics for Your Face. And her handle on Instagram is Fab Face Fabrics. Did I get that all right? Yes, that's right. Thank you. Awesome. Um, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Delena Miyazaki or Delena Live on Facebook. Uh, Shinya, you are Shinstagrams with an underscore Shinstagram. between us on Instagram. Yep. And if you have any questions or uh, topic ideas or would like to be a guest, please send us a message at anythinggoeshokkaido at gmail.com or message us on any of those platforms we just mentioned. We're really excited to go into, this is our third month of the show and uh, you know it's really nice <laughs> to, to keep going and have something uh, to do with some of the downtime, although life is picking back up again. So any last words? Um, I'd like to just say thank you so much for having me on the on the show, and I'm really glad that you're going ahead with the project. It's a good social distancing project, actually, to be doing kind of podcast and radio. So, yeah, I was I was nervous before we started, but you know, I really enjoyed chatting with you. So, thank you very much for having me. Oh, our pleasure! Thank you thank so you. much for coming on. Anything for you, Shinya? Oh, yeah, I'm good. Uh, it was fun, very casual. It's good. So, uh, yes, good luck to you, Geraldine, for all the best for the future, for the writing. Uh, looking forward to seeing, like, some of your pictures during your cycle, I think. It sounds sounds fun, but I would never do that in my life. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe something, like, just in Hokkaido, riding from Sapporo to maybe all the way to the east side sounds good, but... All the way back to London. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's, that's definitely 
in the special category. Yeah. <laughs> it it yeah. takes somebody with a lot of bravery and, uh, you know, big heart to do a project like that. So mm. look forward to following you when you get to make that journey. Okay. All right, everybody. It's the uh, last bit for the show. So, またね、したけ。Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. A huge thanks to everyone who's made this podcast possible. A special thanks to Fabulous Fabrics for your face and Geraldine Danger for being our guest on the show today. If you would like to be a patron or a business sponsor, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, contact us at anythinggoeshokkaido at gmail.com, and be one of the first to see what's going on with our podcast. Thank you for your support and keep on keeping on Hokkaido. Much love to you all. And see you next week on Anything Goes Hokkaido video podcast.